Um, the problem with the, the, the general society is they think talking about sex, sex ruins the fun or ruins the spot in eighty, which I think is crazy. Talking about sex is the best foreplay in the world. Hello, and welcome to Prestige's podcast vodcast series, Sex, Human Rights, and CSA Prevention. Today we are talking to National Coalition for Sexual Freedom founder and spokesperson, Susan Wright. Uh, welcome, Susan. Thanks for joining us today. Well, thank you for having me. I'm really glad to be here. I'm going to start by saying that uh, the National Coalition for Sexual Freedom is one of my favorite resources to share with people uh, who are looking for the kind of help you provide. And so I want to get right into that with uh, who NCSF is and who NCSF represents. Uh, the National Coalition for Sexual Freedom is an advocacy group for the BDSM, leather fetish, um, kink, and non-monogamy communities like polyamory, uh, the lifestyle swingers, um, uh, open relationship, relationship anarchy. So we are basically a coalition of groups and businesses that serve the diverse sexualities. And that's our primary focus um, because we are a true grassroots organization. Mm -hmm. So we reflect our members. Um, and our members are, you know, clubs, businesses. We also have quite a few professional members, people who run um, therapy practices or attorneys mm -hmm. who understand how important it is to, do, to serve these diverse communities. Uh, tell us about your Consent Counts campaign. Ah, Consent Counts is a wonderful campaign. It started in 2007 at, out of a leather caucus at the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force Creating Change Conference. Uh, which is a wonderful seed event for activists and advocacy ideas. That came out, and um, you know about this, it kind of traveled around the country, gained yeah. grassroots support. Mm -hmm. um, individuals wanted to decriminalize BDSM, which was the main goal initially. And um, groups around the country kind of kept it going, and then in late 2008, NCSF took over management of the project. Mm -hmm. And, um, and we've been working on it ever since. I mean, it started out, it had a rough start because as we would go to prosecutors and say, why don't you take into account consent in this criminal case? And they'd be like, what do you mean by consent? Right. So it, we had to actually go back to our communities and really gather a lot of information on what we believe consent is. And that took years of effort to create statements to do surveys, to find out what was really happening so that we could present the data back to the professionals who could have an impact. Uh, I want to pull over just for a second because you mentioned you know about this. Uh, for our listeners, um, I was involved a bit in consent counts in the early days um, with some South Bay kink groups. And so, yes, I was there at some of the beginning stages and for the early talking about it and that kind of thing. I don't want to put any more time into myself here. <laughs> um, but but so, I think it's important. That actually kind of shows what NCSF does. Yeah. We, you know, we really are a coalition. Yes. And really are, you know, it takes people like you being interested in something and kind of carrying it forward. And then the NCSF is this wonderful structure for kind of taking these projects and just turbocharging them. Mm. Well, thank you for that. <laughs> I definitely do consider it to be a very important campaign. It's definitely something I still talk about. So, um, You mentioned a little bit about law enforcement. Uh, how has the conversation with law enforcement changed since the launch of Consent Counts? Have there been improvements in areas where Consent Counts has gained traction? It is a, a real difference, okay? When we started in 1997 and up into Consent Counts, like that first decade, we had what we called the alleged domestic violence call, where somebody, a family member, a neighbor, would hear a scene or see bruises and would call the police on you, mm -hmm. and somebody would be arrested. And um, during the early 2000s, we really started doing a lot of outreach to the police departments. And um, as we took on consent counts, that was a major part of it, to try to explain that people do this consensually, mm -hmm. that you can't just arrest people who are doing consensual sexuality. Um, it it we it wasn't until kind of um, a sea change there with you know Fifty Shades of Grey, with 
um, you know, that kind of really impacted the media and changed the media dynamic. There were so many educators' voices who rose up around that and started talking about, well, this is really what BDSM is. This is really what kink is. It was amazing. And they really did change the dialogue around BDSM. And around in that time, the outreach work we'd been doing and other groups had been doing to the police, this kind of societal change, it's kind of almost flipped. And now you can't get police to take a report sometimes on assault within the BDSM, within a BDSM context, because they don't understand the nuances of consent. They don't understand that you can consent to a spanking but not consent to have sex. Right. And that is a very basic kind of roadblock we've hit with them. Uh, we actually hear them say to people, well, what did you expect? Of course you were going to get beat up if you're doing kink. So um, we are having to really fight that. And of course, we've got wonderful allies in the victim advocacy um, agencies that we've educated. We work with Widener interns to, to give them a kink module so they understand consent in a more nuanced way. But um, this, this kind of ongoing effort with the police, you know, when you have a, a, a project like this that takes decades, right. you kind of see it go through different phases which is what led to the more recent phases of consent counts um, that we've been doing lately. Cool. Um, just out of curiosity, uh, where have you seen consent counts get the most traction? You know, it, it definitely has gained a lot of traction um, within like urban areas where the, especially since the Me Too movement, right. we had a real spike in just general people talking about consent that we never saw before. Um, but we really kind of help lay the groundwork because within all these kind of more concentrated areas, there's a lot of groups have sprung up and they're educating uh, the community members about consent. Yes. So, uh, you know, our, our kink groups, our non-monogamy groups, they really have shifted a focus to be the educators. And so that, that combined with the, the media portrayal that this is not something to be feared, um, this is something that's a lot more thoughtful, um, that's really help. We do still see issues in kind of more rural or very socially conservative areas um, where there's still the moral um, uh, kind of stigma against um, doing any kind of sexuality outside of you know being married and procreating. So um, we do find that like people who have child custody issues in, in these kind of more socially conservative areas, it's, it's harder for them. People who have assault, it's very difficult for them to report to the police. So um, we have a long ways to go still. I would like you to tell us about the American Law Institute project. Ah, well, you know, this actually is still a continuation. It's part of our Consent Counts project. When we realized we hit this roadblock with the police, what we decided to do was to kind of tackle it from the legal angle. All of the case law about BDSM says that consent is not a defense to assault, which is what Consent Counts was created originally to decriminalize BDSM. So we started working with the American Law Institute who are revising the model penal code on sexual assault. There was no definition of consent in the whole penal code on sexual assault. How in the world can you decide if somebody's been assaulted or not if, if, you, if there's no roadmap? And that's the problem with prosecutors. They'll get a case and they say, we believe that this person has assaulted five members of the kink community, but we don't understand how to explain it to the jury or to the judge. Um, so we, we were like, okay, we'll give you the roadmap. Um, so we worked with the American Law Institute and um, helped create their definition of consent, which is uh, a very interesting definition of consent because it actually, you know, it defines that it's a person's willingness to engage in sexual acts. It's, uh, it can be expressed or it can be inferred from behavior, both action and inaction, but it has to be taken in the context of the circumstances. So if it's somebody you've never been with before, you know, the circumstances say that's, you don't have a pattern of behavior with that person. Right. So, whereas if it's somebody you've been with for 20 years and you have a pattern of behavior with that person, you can take that into account. It keeps that artificial thing always having to ask, may I touch you here? May I touch you here? Which we know in the kink community is unworkable. You want to ask that beforehand. 
<laughs> you want to get all that clear before everybody's all hot and bothered, right? And, and then you go into the arena that you've created and you play, right? So we wanted some of this in the, in the definition of consent. And one of the things that was very important was that consent can be revoked or withdrawn at any time. If you don't have a definition of consent, then you don't have a definition of how that consent can be withdrawn. And that's typically what's happening in these situations where somebody uh, either doesn't give consent to begin with, they're kind of bowled over, and when they try to withdraw consent, that's not taken into account because it's like, well, why did you go up to the, the, the apartment then? You know what I mean? Why did you kiss them then? You know, it's like, well, you can withdraw at some point. That's why. So we're very excited about this because we think that this will, um, you know, help not just people in the kink and non-monogamy community, but help everybody because it's a more realistic view of what, um, how consent works in sexual interactions. And this was supposed to be approved in May, but they couldn't have the conference. So it's delayed till next May. And what will happen is once it's um, once it's, it's instituted, we'll go out and create a very large coalition, like what happened around Woodhull, and um, the the lawsuit. And we'll do lobbying. You know, we'll get all these different various groups that have an interest in making sure the consent is enshrined in law, and um, go state by state to lobby state legislators to accept the model penal code. And I think that that will have a huge impact on our communities as well as everybody else. Cool. And that's because that counts. That you were there at the birth of it, you know? You're right. Think of that. It's almost as if all of these issues go together and dovetail somehow. Uh, Absolutely. So uh, in talking and in looking through NCSF's website and doing my own little research, uh, you did mention something about sex education for college campuses, and I would love to hear more about that. Yes, um, we've always supported the college campus groups. Um, they have struggled. Um, they struggle because sometimes they're denied funding that other campus groups get. Um, sometimes when they try to do their events like a sex week, they're attacked by the media. So we've always worked with these campus groups. The problem is, is that people leave the college after a certain number of years and then people have to recreate the wheel. So what we're trying to do now is work with Title IX um, advisors and, and professors and, and health departments to make them our contact. We've created resources on consent. Uh, we have a college campus resource guide for consent that has general resources on you know general sexuality as well as specific kink and non-monogamy. Um, and these are you know, videos, like a cup of tea video, you know, which is so useful. Um, I mean, certainly it doesn't cover all aspects, but it kind of gets gets it into your mind of don't pour tea into somebody's mouth who's unconscious. You, know? <laughs> you start to like realize, wait a second, how come, how come, how come these loopholes that were always used, it, that's the thing we need to get rid of. Um, the idea is not to have sex, but to have, have fully consensual, enthusiastic uh, willing sex. Okay, uh, and you went into a little bit, but uh, how much detail about consensual sex practices should be taught as part of comprehensive sex education, and how much should be left for people to discover on their own? Well, I think once you hit an adult age, you know, 18 and over, like colleges, that education should be out there. I mean, the kink and non-monogamy communities are the only ones educating adults about this, other than tantra, tantra groups, you know, that are focused on certain specific kinds of sexuality, um, there really is no general education about sexuality. Um, you often see it accessed as like couples through kind of a therapeutic kind of uh, way, sex therapy. Um, so we really believe it's very important and we're very disturbed to see things like Turning Point um, USA sending students out to target professors who teach like sexuality or sexual history through the ages. Um, and try to disrupt those classes um, and to the point where, you know, universities are not willing to, like, buck that. So they'll shut down. They'll, they'll, they'll take away those classes. So we're seeing an assault on our ability to be able to access this information even as adults, which is where it really becomes problematic for us because certainly any adult in America should be able to access um, sex education. 
and it should be available just like the chess club is available and the ROTC is available on college campuses for those who want to access it. Um, as you know, there are various ways of expressing what consensual kink should look like, such as safe, sane, and consensual, and risk-aware consensual kink. Which model do you subscribe to and why? Well, um, I personally like safe, sane, and consensual just because I came up with safe, sane, and consensual. And it's a wonderful model uh, motto. Um, it's you know certainly safer you know saner um, and now that we've gotten the American Psychological Association to um, to remove to depathologize BDSM to kind of remove it from their DSM this accusation that we're mentally ill is not hanging around us as much as it was back in the older days um, risk aware consensual kink also has wonderful um, aspects being risk aware is really important um, that is kind of the part of informed consent that's often missed you can just say yes I'll do that but if you don't know the risks you're not really aware of what you're consenting to right. so I really like that aspect but NCSF in general uh, does not subscribe to any particular kind of consent slogan in fact as part of our consent counts project we have a lot of different consent signs, which are amazing. They're very graphic. They're, they've got the images that, that would pertain to certain different communities. Um, and it has slogans like um, some of them it's yes means yes, right? Some of them it's no means no. Um, some spaces it's consent is implied before denied, like at some leather clubs. Right. And they want to make sure and, and alert anybody coming in that this is what the consent standard is. And that's what we want. We want clubs to engage in this communication and decide what your consent standard is, decide what your consent policy is. We also have sample consent policies. And just make sure you communicate that to the people who are coming so that everybody's on the same page in this space and people can pick the space that's most comfortable for them. Mm -hmm. Uh, since we're talking about communities, the poly community, the leather community, the all of those fun communities, um, let's see, uh, what could the consensual kink, BDSM, and leather communities teach vanilla people about consent? Um, I think that we know consent uh, a lot better than most people. We understand that consent is communication, that um, consent is about uh, talking to, to people about what it is that you enjoy, what it is that you would like to do, um, issues that you've had in the past that might kind of impact on that, uh, fears that you have, excitements that you have. Um, the problem with the, the, the general society is they think talking about se sex ruins the fun or ruins the spontaneity, which I think is crazy. Talking about sex is the best foreplay in the world. I mean... And, and then you're on the same page. And then you know the person really wants to do what you want to do. I saw a poll that said that most um, people, like over half people, are not even talking to their partners about what's really turning them on. How sad is that? How do you, you have know? sex that way without communication? I... <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, we need to be able to communicate this information. So, um yeah, that's, that's the thing that we have. And, you know, that's why we see consent um, incidents happen in, like, the first few years. Because people are coming into our communities and learning how to talk about sex. That's really what they're learning how to do, is how to say, I like this, and be comfortable. Say, I like this, I own this. <laughs> this is what we have. Um, and after that first, you know, few years or before they come into the community, you really, it's like 75% of the consent incidents are happening there when people are working this out. How do the consensual kink, um, BDSM, and leather communities deal with abuse within the community? Oh, this is a good question. Because we kind of got stymied by law enforcement, um, of course we really would like people to report assault to law enforcement. Um, but because they weren't really taking action, um, we started to see predators within the community who were going like one person to the next to the next. Um, and that's a problem. You know, you have the people who come into the community who are kind of clueless and are learning and might perpetuate consent incidents, but those are the people we want to grab and educate, right? right? Teach. And, and that's why we need to start at the social level. When social violations are happening, that's when we need, you know, you need to ask before you hug. Some people think that's crazy. 
that is modeling consent before they get to the point where they're actually kind of imposing something on somebody sexually. So it's those social um, modeling that we do that's super important. But then if it gets to the point where somebody has been reported um, two or more times, that's starting to show a pattern. And you can often see in these people that have like three, four reports, there's a pattern where it's not like each individual is different what they're doing. They're doing the same thing over and over again mm -hmm. because that pattern is more important than the person they're with. Right. Those are the people that we don't need to have in our community. Mm -hmm. And those are the people that are being banned by groups. They have realized it, it used to be kind of a hands-off. If it didn't happen right in front of me, you know, I don't care. Well, now they've started to realize you get a certain number of reports and it's a minuscule, it's like 3% are false reports mm -hmm. once you go to two people falsely reporting somebody it goes to like you know a thousandth of a percent wow. do you really want to risk your members and and yourself for being sued you know if somebody you know has assaulted somebody you've got to report and then they assault somebody else at your event or because they met at your event that person could sue you yeah you know medical bills and so groups have just realized um uh, you know well, they may not like drama <laughs> <laughs> but they have to deal with their own members and they have to make a safe space for their members. So that's something that's really happening and they're kind of networking together in different regions to like let each other know and kind of behind the scenes. You can't do this on FetLife. It's not the sort of thing that if you go out and are very public about it, you'll get sued by the people you're accusing, right? right? Mm -hmm. So it's it's not something that's done uh, in, in visibly but it's done by all the organizers behind the scenes to ensure that our communities um, um, are as safe as we can possibly make them, but we can't guarantee anything. That's why, you know, you, you can't guarantee who's coming in. So we have to teach everybody how to protect themselves. Mm -hmm. so they, we launch them out into the world. <laughs> Much better able, hopefully, to see when somebody's imposing themselves on them. Following that up a little bit, I got a question on Twitter uh, from a sex worker who is in need, and we got an answer on Twitter, but I wanted to ask you here for this platform, uh, just, uh, is NCSF sex worker friendly? Are you a resource for sex workers as well? Oh, absolutely. Um, we've always, um, you know, early on when we were founded in 1997, we actually made that a policy that we supported um, sex, sex workers within the kink community because that's where we were focused at the moment. Mm -hmm. And then as we expanded, of course, we've been um, very friendly to sex workers. Um, we, uh, our resources are available to them through our incident reporting and response. For example, um, we help sex workers who are having trouble with child custody issues. It's very important that you have a good child custody attorney mm -hmm. help you as well as um, sometimes you need an expert witness um, to, to speak up and um, you know cite the data that shows that sex workers are fine parents um, you know there is no problem here um, we also help uh, sex workers who have been assaulted unfortunately it happens and um, we never want anybody to be alone uh, in dealing with that so again we, we network people together with professionals with victim advocacy agencies that we know are sympathetic to uh, our diverse populations as well as sex workers. And, um, and you know, we, we deal with the, the prosecutors and the detectives. I mean, like NCSF is there to, to try to educate. So that's just a couple of ways that we um, help sex workers directly. And I, and I really do hope they understand that, you know, this resource is there for them when they need it. We also work on the bigger overarching advocacy issues NCSF doesn't tend to take the lead in these issues. We we love groups like Decriminalizing Sex Work, you know, amazing, SOAR Institute. Um, we take their lead um, and we lend our voice, I, like um, Prostasia Foundation, you know, in terms of the um, amicus brief for the Woodhull case, mm -hmm. challenging FOSTA, which has really chilled speech and made it so difficult for us to be able to have that kind of communication that consenting adults need, you know, they cut it off. So we, we are very supportive about, on those big issues. We just don't take the lead because we want to make sure that um, sex worker voices lead those efforts. That's great. Thank you very much for that answer. Um, I definitely like for as many people as possible to know that there are resources for them. 
Oh, absolutely. And, you know, I'm just so happy to see the sex worker movement kind of gaining speed. And, yeah. and Because, honestly, I mean, our, our Consent Counts program actually did change last year the, the definition. It was set up to be decriminalizing BDSM. But we changed that to decriminalizing sexuality between consenting adults, which encompasses sex work. Right. Because there really is this this if you cannot control access to your own body in such a fundamental way, we are not individually free. Okay. Um, since uh, you can't get away from law enforcement and it's in the news and there's a whole bunch going on, um, I'm going to go ahead and ask you, defund the police, yes or no? You know, NCSF put out our new vision and um, uh, diversity and inclusion vision uh, at, at, towards the beginning of May, before all of this like, kind of really hit. It's something we've been working on for um, quite a while, um, this, you know, the, the systemic inequalities. And um, it's something that's very important to us as a grassroots organization because we have to make sure we're representing everybody. So our diversity and inclusion vision is basically to fulfill our mission through a better understanding of the diverse range of voices and experiences within, within our communities. And we put out, um, you know, when this all happened, we ended up putting out a statement, um, you know, in support of Black Lives Matter, uh, in support of their um, efforts to, you know, end systemic racism uh, in law enforcement. We see these systemic issues. Um, uh, we certainly see that people of color are treated differently um, when they are caught up uh, by the justice system. Um, I've seen it myself. I've been dealing with this for you know over 20 years now, and without a doubt, um, people with money uh, and people who uh, look you know cis gendered you know um, are, are dis disproportionately get off. Right. Even when they're convicted, they get off with sentence. Uh, it's very frustrating. So we certainly say that um, we want to end the ongoing fight. Uh, you know, we want to end state-sanctioned state violence. And certainly by bringing in more social workers, by um, taking police, uh, beat cops, so they're not like the front lines. Mm -hmm. uh, it would be so much better if communities police themselves. I mean, I see this here in my little community. We have a volunteer posse, and it's made up of people in our community. We don't have a local police force here. Mm -hmm. And these people go around and help people. I mean, that's what they're there for. And if something is serious, if somebody has a gun and they're threatening people, we call on the sheriff. But that's the only time. You know, otherwise, somebody's asleep in a car or drunk in a, in a drive through We deal with it in a more um, um, humane way. And that's the way that it should be. Um, I find it very terrifying that the police budgets have risen so much and become so militarized. Um, and... Yeah, we, we see systemic um, discrimination happening on a lot of different levels, and so we are absolutely in support of what's happening with these protests and um, are ready, willing, and able to contribute where we can, uh, and certainly by leading the way by looking inward uh, at our own organization. Um, we think it's really important that we make sure that we're raising voices that need to, to be heard, uh, that we are choosing volunteers that uh, reflect a very diverse range of voices um, and, um, and are doing work as a board every month in terms of, um, you know, trying to educate ourselves. It's very hard to look past your own privilege, we've realized. And it is, it is very hard to confront yourself. And I'm so happy we're having a reckoning right now where I see so many people who are willing to confront uh, their blind spots. Uh, I've never seen such a groundswell like this before, and um, I have my fingers crossed that it will um, yeah, continue on. Thanks for your time, Susan. Bye for now. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thanks for watching this episode of Sex, Human Rights, and CSA Prevention. Don't miss out on our future podcasts. Subscribe to the podcast or click this button to follow our channel on YouTube.